know why you're here on the tour, and uh, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, welcome uh, and introduce our speakers today. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think that the size of the crowd here uh, uh, really uh, is representative of what we're trying to do and where we are currently, <laughs> what it is we're trying to do. Uh, I, I, uh, I apologize to Ted and Marjorie, uh, because uh, if people really knew what was good for them, They'd be here, but uh, uh, the, uh, the empty seats is a, is a vote of profound ignorance on our part, which we are going to work to change. We are going to work to change. Now, uh, the idea uh, behind this uh, is uh, I have a feeling that uh, I, have a, well, I direct one of the science institute in court, and uh, that uh, there are a lot of good things that happen in uh, universities, uh, typically through the research programs, uh, that... Uh, don't get uh, to the people who could use them in, in, a, in a way that brings about the large numbers. And uh, when it does happen, sometimes it just happens by accident. And uh, so my, my goal is to put this idea on the radar screen uh, here, at least in the learning sciences at Vanderbilt. Uh, and, and the idea is simply this. How uh, can professors uh, and students uh, who develop uh, products that have uh, uh, potential for helping uh, kids uh, in schools uh, uh, better reach that market. And uh, one of the possibilities is publishing. There are other possibilities as well. And I, I myself am a babe in the woods on this. I don't know exactly what publishers could do uh, for me. Uh, but obviously, uh, Ted and uh, Marjorie Mayer have uh, formed a partnership that has been good for both of them, and I will have to say has been good for uh, Vanderbilt as well. In fact, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Harry Potter series is published by Scholastic, and it's probably their biggest number. It would be hard for me to believe this. Oh, no, it's the biggest number. <laughs> it's the biggest number of any publisher anywhere. Yes. But, but, but get a load of this, guys. You know who's number two? Royalties. I just heard last night. Vanderbilt has gotten uh, a big royalty check out of this. Thanks to Ted. We owe you big time, Ted. Uh, and you, of course, as well. But we're second in that, in that whole business. So, uh, 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 Ted, uh, I'll start uh, by introducing Ted Hasselbrink. And Ted was a professor here uh, for about 15 years. Uh, then he went off and got a distinguished chair professorship at the University of Kentucky. And then uh, he uh, decided, for whatever reasons, that he'd like to come back to Vanderbilt. And we are delighted to do that. Uh, uh, but uh, whether he was at Kentucky or here, we still got the check. That's Even right. though we were still getting the check, we still are super glad to have him back. Uh, uh, he was a professor in special education in uh, uh, he, uh, I looked at his resume last night, very impressive, you know, think about a guy, we're talking read 180 is the product here. And sometimes you think, well, those guys, they just publish textbooks, and you know, professors sometimes stumble their nose at that. This guy's got lots of peer-reviewed publications, he's got terrific CV, he's got, he gets grants like, uh, I wish that I would have been around and hit you in the LSI when you were getting all those grants, but I know you're going to bring in some more now, so... Uh, the guy is a, a total 100% uh, uh, impressive uh, professor, but in addition to that, he has this product, the Navy, which is the hearing. Now, how he got with Scholastic, maybe we'll learn more about that, but he's been working with Marjorie Mayer, who is the uh, president of Scholastic Education. Uh, she's been with Scholastic uh, in one role or another uh, for a while. Before that, she was president of Ginn, and uh, Ginn, I think, published uh, the old uh, C-Spot Run, or maybe, I don't know, Ginn Reader back in the day. Was yeah, that wasn't C-Spot Run, but it was a Ginn Reader. So, it was yeah. a Ginn Reader. It was a big deal, I know. <laughs> it was a big deal. It was, it was, believe it or not, I believe, even before when I was born. <laughs> Only a little bit. Uh, 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 and uh, she was uh, also, uh, at, she was a VP at the uh, uh, whole fine art uh, school publishing. Uh, she's a Phi Beta Kappa from Middlebury, and she did grad work at MIT. So that's a, uh, she's obviously done extremely well in the ed sector of publishing. 
So I'm going to turn it over to the two of you, and we hope to learn, uh, uh, get some insight into how professors can work with publishers, publishers can work with professors, what each can do for the other to bring products to kids so that kids can learn better. Yeah, thank you so much. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad there's a pretty small group here because I really hope we can make this interactive and people will ask questions. And, uh, yeah, I'm delighted to be here. I haven't been here since I was down visiting y'all 11 years ago, whatever it was, to sign the deal to, uh, to acquire the rights to the, what was called the Peabody Learning Lab and now is called Read 180. So uh, please interrupt us, ask questions. Ted and I are not very rehearsed, and uh, we want to make this fairly informal. So um, we, we put this into sort of chapters, and the first chapter is, is what is Read 180, because I'm assuming everybody doesn't know what it is. And um, it, is, it, is, it is the number one reading intervention program in the country right now. Uh, it's, we've, we've got three editions of it, or three versions. One version is for upper elementary, one version is for middle school, and one version is for high school. All of those versions uh, start kids at pretty much a middle of first grade, end, uh, end of first grade, beginning of second grade reading level, and they all take them up to, uh, to grade level. The reason why we did three different versions is we wanted to, the content in each version to be developmentally appropriate. So, of course, that's one of the big problems in reading intervention. If you're 14 years old and you read like a third grader, uh, you don't want to read a third grade reading book. So uh, that's why we have three versions. We are targeting kids at the 10th to 40th percentile. Um, there are places that have kids in it that are above the 40th percentile, and they claim that it that it helps them. But we we don't. That's not our goal. Our goal is really the 10th to 40th. That's a that's a lot of kids. I mean, that's that's close to half the kids in the country fall into those percentiles. And when you go into the big cities, it's more than that. We, we don't target below the 10th because if, if students do not have foundational reading skills, if they're not, uh, if they're not uh, fluent decoders, we really think they need to be in a precursor to Read 180. And one of the things that uh, we're working with Ted on is, is we call it the prequel, a program for kids that are below the 10th percentile. But that's, so we're very targeted, very specific. Um, and we do, we do, one of the things about Read 180, it's not a supplemental program. It is a replacement program for core instruction. So students are in it for 90 minutes a day. Um, most of our kids are in middle school, but we have kids in high school and upper elementary. And it really replaces their standard language arts curriculum. So we have to give good coverage to reading and language arts skills, or we don't meet the standards that states ask for. Some places have kids in Read 180 and have them in a regular language arts program because we don't cover every single skill. Um, and some places are so skills obsessed that they do do that. But we are a comprehensive replacement curriculum. And, and Read 180 is big. It's not just a software program. It's big. It includes assessment. Um, and it includes both periodic assessment as well as continuous assessment. And you're going to see some, we're going to show you a couple of the reports it, it gives. It does include student software. Kids are on the software 20 minutes a day. Um, it has a very robust management system for enrolling students and looking at their data and, and, uh, and making decisions about how students are interacting with the program. Um, lots of print support, lots of books for kids to read, teachers' editions. Um, uh, tons of support. It's not just all on the computer. Um, we do professional development when we sell the program. It comes with uh, professional development for teachers and for administrators. And we also have to provide a lot of technical support. As you can imagine, a lot of schools have very brittle, crazy, wacky, patched together technology and uh, trying to make something like this work on the complexity of software in schools takes an enormous amount of work. Um, we are very, very, very much, if you had to ask what business is Read 180 in, it's in the achievement business. We are all about raising kids' achievement. And you can't be in that business without proving that your materials work. So when we, um, when we acquired our pro the program from Vanderbilt, it did have a body of research. Ted had done a lot of work at, in Orlando and uh, done a lot of work here, had a lot of federal grants. But since 
we acquired it. Well, there have been more than 30 studies, including third-party research, which some of this has come from schools where schools are examining themselves. Is this working in our schools? Some of it has come from state agencies that are taking a look at it. Uh, but a lot of it we've had to uh, help pay for, too. Um, uh, two years ago, the federal government gave out eight Striving Reader grants. This, they identified eight districts uh, to put in uh, five to seven million a year to improve adolescent literacy, and Read 180 was in four of the eight. Um, and I think the most that any other program was in was one. So we were in four times more than any other um, any other program. And what's really been exciting about Read 180 is. It, we have great evidence that it's been replicated over and over again, which, of course, replication is, is key, that READ 180 really does work. And it really does work with all kinds of kids. Um, we do disaggregate our data by uh, No Child Left Behind, AYP groups. Um, so we've got evidence that works with different age groups, works with, different, uh, with English language learners, special ed. And, uh, and we're going to show you a little bit of those studies right now. So, Ted, yeah. yeah. Um, what was interesting to me is that when we first did Read 180, uh, what became Read 180, we had a lot of, a lot of efficacy data from uh, our prototype work. And schools really weren't interested in that because now it wasn't a prototype anymore. They, they wanted to know what effect does Read 180 have on, on kids. So it was like starting all over again. Um, I made the decision, it's probably a good one, that I wasn't going to do that research, that I was done... Uh, Scholastic on the program, and someone else is going to do the efficacy research of Read 180. So a lot of what you see, and Mar Marjorie has already uh, talked about this, is a lot of districts took that on themselves. One that uh, I was most interested in was uh, Phoenix Union, and, and they looked at uh, their performance against the state of uh, Arizona for you know from 2000 to 2004, and they were consistently way below uh, the the rest of the state. Uh, in 2003, 2004, they implemented Read 180 in their ninth grade. The following year, when they looked at their 10th graders, they almost closed that gap. So that's one of many studies that have been done by school systems looking at the efficacy of what they do. Uh, another interesting one was uh, uh, Des Moines, which um, I really like because it, it looks only at special education. Uh, and well, well, we can go through all this. The most important thing that came out of this study, and they've done this over five years, is that on average about 18% of their special ed kids are taken out of special ed back into the regular classroom each year after, inter after an intervention. That's like unheard of. I mean, you know, people talk about the death sentence of being put in special ed, that once you're there, you're there. You're more likely to get out of special ed by dying than by placing out from, from testing. Yet in Des Moines, they consistently move kids out. So they're very, very happy uh, with the result. Uh, and this is a, a very interesting, this was just done by uh, uh, the uh, Florida Center for Reading Research. Joe Torgerson's group, and they looked at retention of teachers, which is a huge problem, especially with teachers working with struggling readers, because it's so hard to do. Uh, and what they found when they compared uh, three different interventions, that the Read 180 had about 96% retention of those teachers. And we see that over and over. We, talk, we hear teachers who say, I'm not retiring because I like doing this so much, or I'm having so much fun that I'm, you know, I don't want to quit doing this. And so the retention is amazing. And so there are a lot of different measures to look at, and, and a lot of schools are doing that. Uh, but it, it's impressive because you just keep seeing these results over and over again. I think that's why Read 180 has been so successful. Uh, because, you know, one school will talk to another school and say, you know, what are you doing? And, and they'll talk about Read 180, and it just, it's, it's almost like a snowball effect. It's been really fun to watch uh, from that perspective. Um, you can talk about this. This is Well, this, this, is, this is, yeah, this is, a, this is an ad that we've been running this year in Ed Week and other places, and uh, um, this, is, this is our marketing message, proven effective. That's it. That's all we have to say. Um, and by proven effective, uh, that's a complicated thing to deliver on because it's not a you can't I always say it doesn't work if you don't take it out of the box. It has to be implemented. It ha we have to train teachers. The technology has to work. But now we are in we're, uh, this ad came out uh, in September. We're now in 11,000 classrooms 
Uh, we're in all 50 states. Um, and those little red blurbs on there, you can go to our website, and those little red blurbs are different studies that were done across the country. You can go in our website, open the study, and take a look at, um, and take a look at the data. So um, here's what Read 180 success has meant to Vanderbilt. Uh, we have paid... Read one, uh, we've paid Vanderbilt almost $14 million in royalties. As Andy said, you're the number two royalty recipient after uh, J.K. Rowling and, uh, and since 2000. And, uh, and, we, and it's been good for us and good for you. We would love to do more. So this is how Read 180 came to be. Let's start with you, Ted. Well... As anyway, we just had a discussion with Andy about the NAEP data. But, you know, if you look at NAEP over the years, uh, when you look at uh, middle and high school kids, they really haven't changed that much. And, and you know, you go in and you look at uh, especially inner city um, uh, areas, high poverty areas, those kids really perform poorly. And we knew that back in 1985, and I'll, I'll talk more a little about this. But, you know, we knew that these kids were in trouble, and that's really what got us started looking at what can we do with technology to really make a difference. But basically, those kids have, have stayed pretty flat over the years. Um, when, when we started, and Bill Corbin probably remembers this, Bill and I have been around for 100 years, but um, in 1984, Apple Computer... Uh, provided to our tech center uh, some some Apple II or uh, Mac II uh, computers. I think there were four of them and some money to start looking at adult literacy. Actually, Apple this is no one knows this. Bill knows this, but they actually had a division of adult literacy at one time, and they came to us and, and had us start doing the research. And that's really what got us starting looking at older individuals who were uh, struggling readers. Then. Uh, right after that, in 1985, uh, the U.S. Department of Ed, Office of Special Ed Programs, came out with an RFP, and they wanted to look at uh, what technology would do for uh, learning disabled students in middle and high school. We competed for that grant and got that grant. It was a three-year grant. And then we su were successful in two more rounds of funding around that. And it was that approximately 10-year period of time uh, that allowed us to really do all the development. It really was a lot of research, but a lot of development. So we would we would create a prototype, we'd go in, we'd test it out, uh, and then we'd make changes, we'd go back in, test it again. It was a very iterative process, a very time-consuming, very, very long process, until we got to the point where we had something we called the Peabody Literacy Lab. And that was our working prototype of what we thought would make a difference for these older kids. Um, in the last three years of this, we were out in Williamson County, in Brentwood High School, Fairview Middle School and High School, and Page High School. I don't know how many of you know where those places are, but they're kind of, you know, well, Page and, and Fairview are out in the middle of nowhere, okay? They were back then. Now there are houses all over there. But back then, it was like you drove forever. They were very rural, but the kids there were really struggling. There were a lot of rural kids who were really struggling, but they gave us great insight into what was working. The kids loved it. We, we had very good results of that. Uh, but what was most important uh, is, is at that time, we were presenting these findings at national conferences. And I got a call in 1994 uh, from Orange County Public Schools in Florida, which is the Orlando public school system, uh, and they called us and said, we've got a big problem. Uh, we need your help. We know the work that you're doing. Would you come down and work with us? And we did. We were down there uh, starting in 94 through 97 working with them. And we worked with about 10,000 students in uh, fourth grade through high school uh, in trying to boost their reading scores. And, in fact, we did it. Every year we got great results in terms of uh, increases in reading scores, increases in GPA, uh, we got increases in attendance, uh, we got increases in, uh, or decreases in behavioral referrals. So we've seen just a lot of good things happening, but most importantly for Orange County, we got big gains in their uh, standardized reading scores. And that's what they were looking at. They wanted to raise their reading scores. And on average, we would get about two to four years of growth for every year of intervention that we had using that, that Peabody Learning Lab, and, and they were thrilled. Um, and it was about that time, it was actually in the middle of this study, in 1995, 
this is the most serendipitous part of this whole thing, is that uh, Margie and I served on an advisory board uh, for the, the Center for Applied Special Technology in Boston. It's a, a small research center up there. And Margie and I didn't know each other, and we got thrown together on this advisory board, and we just started talking. And she said, what do you do? And I said, well, we're doing this great stuff down in Florida. Uh, and she said, I'd like to look at it. I'd like to see what you're doing. Uh, and Marjorie came down here to Vanderbilt. Actually, it was in this room. I don't know if you remember that or not. But yeah, you know what? Room. It was in this room. That's right. And we showed her the Peabody Learning Lab for the first time. And then for the next six weeks, there were someone down every week from, from uh, Scalab. They said, we got someone else that needs to see this, someone else that needs to see this. And that went on for about six weeks. And finally, um, the great news is that uh, you know they said, we think we're interested. And, and I'll let Marjorie tell the rest of that. But uh, it was really very serendipitous that we got thrown together. Uh, but we'd had you know, you know, over 10 years of work going into this before we ever we ever met Marjorie. And the other thing, I, let me say this, in 1994 and 1995, we never thought about a product. That was not what we were doing. We were just trying to understand better how technology could impact kids who were really struggling readers. Uh, and it wasn't probably until around 1995-96 that we even thought that you know, publishing this might even be a possibility. It was, it was Marjorie really that, that pushed us, I think, in that direction. Um, you can talk about Scholastic. So uh, Scholastic was founded in 1920 by my boss's father. We've had two chairmen, my boss, Dick Robinson, and his father, Maurice Robinson, which is pretty unusual. We've never been bought by anybody. We're an, an old-fashioned American success story. So my boss's father, Maurice Robinson, came in 1920. It was right after World War I. <laughs> And uh, the world had changed for young people in the United States right after World War I. A bunch of young people had been to Europe, and, and uh, it was, you know, post-1900. The textbooks had been, were, were over from the last century. Students wanted something different. They wanted something fresher. And he started the company with the idea that there was going to be this new generation of kids with new needs. And that big idea that there's new generations of kids with new needs, that's still the way we look at what we do today. So, um, so Ted's, your thing started in 85, mine starts in 1920. In 1964, Dick Robinson, my boss, Maurice's son, he had uh, taught some inner city kids after he got out of college, and he was really, really interested in that middle school uh, adolescent kid who was not succeeding. And he started something called Scope Magazine, which was directed at struggling readers. Uh, out of Scope Magazine, we started publishing more books, and we've always had within our company a strand of attention for those adolescents that are struggling. Then in 1981, um, we started a software division. Um, that was really early, uh, extremely early. It almost bankrupted the company, um, and, uh, but, but my boss, to his credit, he did not, he never lost his excitement about technology. He always believed that technology had huge promise. And in 1992, we, we published a program called WiggleWorks, which is for kindergarten through second or third grade. And the reason I'm mentioning this is before, 19, before we published WiggleWorks, the technology for schools divided into two camps. There was supplemental technology that cost, you know, maybe $99, like you could buy, like the Bank Street Writer, which was something we published, which would have been $99. Or there were um, programs like Justin's Learning, CCC, that had these big... Uh, ILSs, you know, learning systems where kids would go into a lab and work on a computer. And we, I feel like we kind of invented a new category of software, which was more systematic software for the classroom at a higher price point. So uh, CCC might cost uh, fifty, sixty thousand dollars to put it into a school at that time, or a hundred dollars for these little supplemental things. WiggleWorks was $5,000 to put in a, a, an early reading program. And I'll, I'll tell you why this was important. It was important because it allowed us to pay for the marketing and sales costs taken to sell something. We just couldn't afford to send somebody on a plane to go sell a $99 box of Bank Street Writer. And we didn't really want to get into the whole system of kids going and sitting in a, in a, in a, in a lab and, and detaching what they were doing in technology from what they were doing in the classroom. So we came up with this idea of a price point that justified the sales and marketing and was more systematic, more classroom-based. And, and we had a lot of success with WiggleWorks. So then in 1995, Ted and I met. And um, 
uh, we, we, I, I didn't remember the six weeks of people going back and forth. What I remember is Ted coming to New York and showing the prototype for the Peabody Learning Lab, and my boss, Dick Robinson, he, I think Ted was maybe 20 minutes into it, and Dick said, let's do this. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't a hard decision for us. We, 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 we were really excited about it. We thought it was going to be really fantastic. And, and we, we, we were so excited because we really felt that adolescents were, had been forgotten. And, um, and then I put 2000 on here because this was really important for us. We had been in the textbook business, and a lot of our thinking, our money, our attention, our salespeople, everything was going into selling textbooks. And we decided in 2000 to exit the segment because we just couldn't, we couldn't make enough money in it. We couldn't. We, we were so much smaller than Pearson and Harcourt and the other big textbook publishers that we didn't have the scale to really, uh, really succeed. Even though we had a good product and we had a lot of, we had people who still use our stuff. So, but when we did that, it really freed us to focus on. Uh, read 180 and doing other new things that were outside of that whole textbook business. It got us out of the adoption business. It got us out of the um, suffocating requirements to do everything the safest possible way when you do textbooks. Um, we didn't have to subject ourselves to these committees that are concerned about, you know, what did you say about evolution? We really could go and do our thing. And after 2000, is, is that in combination with No Child Left Behind is really when things started to take off. Well, this is this is the summary of the timeline. Um, the one thing that I think that makes Read 180 unique is the fact that it's you know much of it was based upon the concept of anchor instruction, and, and and Bill will remember this. At the Tech Center, beginning in 1984, we started publishing uh, around this concept of anchor instruction. We looked at it in math, we looked at it in uh, social studies, and we looked at it in, in uh, literacy. And uh, basically, we were using video at the time. Then we were using video discs. Some of you are too young to remember video discs. They were, these big, looked like uh, big record albums, and they were clunky as hell. But, uh, you know, they would work for our research. Uh, luckily, we went beyond that because they never would have worked as a commercial product. They, they were just too clunky. It never would have worked. Uh, but that was really some of the, the early work that we did. And then, of course, we used uh, anger destruction for building comprehension. Then we were doing a whole separate set of studies on fluency. And, and it was that combination of anchor instruction around comprehension and then fluency that I think made it so unique. Uh, then, of course, I already told you about this. We entered Orange County. That's where we really saw in a real-world environment that we were making a difference with lots of kids. We were getting kids, uh, turning a lot of kids just totally turned their lives around, kids that were wanted to drop out of school, all of a sudden were learning to read and said, this is great, I want to stay in school. And that was, for us, the real uh, aha moment. Uh, then, of course, in 97, that was when you signed the contract with Vanderbilt, I think. Uh, and Marjorie just said this. Um, NCLB had a huge impact on Read 180 because for the first time, I think, schools had to pay attention to kids who were doing poorly. They couldn't hide those kids anymore. And so all of a sudden, schools are like panicked. You know, what do we do with these middle and high school kids that can't read? And so because we had a product, at the, I think the only product at the time that dealt with middle and high school non-readers, it was like this perfect nexus. I mean, it really was the perfect storm for me to get because there was a huge need nationally, and there was a product that met that need. I really do think that, that made a big difference. Um, you might want to talk about Job Corps and, and Miami Day because you've been more involved. In yeah, um, Job Corps. We in 2003, jo we were excited that Job Corps started to pilot the program, and um, uh, they're still using it. But it, it really showed it could work with young adult learners, and uh, and also in Miami in 2003, it, we want, they uh, set up a uh, improvement zone. And they put the program into the entire improvement zone. They're still using it. They're getting fantastic results. And it's a very, very tough environment, as you can imagine. And then in 2005, um, we brought out a new edition of Read 180. Uh, we worked with Kate Kinsella and Kevin Feldman, who are two professors in California. And um, in the new edition of Read 180, 
Um, we upgraded the technology, but we also upgraded the uh, materials in the classroom for, for kids and uh, for teachers. And, we, and since 2005, we've upgraded half of all READ 180 installation to the new edition, which I think is a real accomplishment. Okay, how we work together. Um, so in terms of the, this is what you're here for, probably. How does all this work? How do you know, university people and publishers work together? Um, th this, is, this is important, first of all. Okay? Uh, I'm going to give you a little background on this. This is what our on-screen tutor looked like in 1985. That's what we started with. Okay? When Scholastic came to the game, this is what they brought. Okay? Uh, a total change in look and feel and, and everything. So we were, uh, we well, can see where we were, uh, and you can see where they were. Uh, but that's not insignificant, okay? What they could provide in terms of resources and technical support was significant, and that's really important. But what I think we brought, one, is the science. Uh, you know, we worked on this research for 10 years, basically, uh, and really did feel we had something that made a difference for kids. I mean, we had, we had good data to show that if, if these kids you know, are, are on this intervention consistently, we can, in fact, change their lives. And that was the science that Scholastic needed. Uh, we provided a prototype. When, we, when, we, when they licensed what is now READ 180, they licensed the prototype. It was a working prototype that we'd been using for over five years, and we had good data on that. So they had a model to go from. Um, so, and, that, and that's the research and validation. We knew that prototype worked. We had great data on that prototype. Uh, as it turns out, schools didn't care about the prototype, but you know, we knew it worked. Uh, we had you know, ongoing consultation. I still work with them uh, around Read 180. And this is real important. Uh, when, when, and I'm sure Janice will remember this. Part of the, the licensing agreement with, Vander, or with Vanderbilt from Scholastic was that they could license the prototype but they couldn't change it unless it was true to our original research. And to their credit, they have, they have maintained uh, that uh, consistency with what we did. And so I'll come in, they'll, they'll say, when they're doing upgrades, they'll, I'll come, go in and they'll say, here's what we're thinking about, is that okay? And basically, you know, as long as it's still true to what we, we learned originally, we'll say yes. Uh, and then professional development. I still go out uh, on occasion and we'll, when they'll have uh, what they call intervention conventions, they do this four times a year where they'll bring in uh, potential customers. And I go in and basically talk about the research. Why, why does READ 180 work? And it's not about the product, it's about the research that we did to understand how to make a difference with kids. And then I think that's really important because as a prospective customer, they want to understand what is the underlying uh, uh, you know, research and, and, and theory behind this thing. So that's kind of what Vanderbilt brings to this relationship. Uh, and Scholastic brings a lot more. So I'll let you talk well, about that. Well, we, we, you know, we do the product development and design. Uh, we are very, very careful not to uh, do anything to read 180 that's going to not be a posit have a positive effect on achievement. Uh, we have a very valuable property in Read 180. The last thing we want to do is water it down, make it work less well. So we do go to TED for everything, but but we think we do a good job in terms of design and making it in interesting for kids and bringing that interest issue to kids, and you're going to see that in a few minutes. Well, of course, we do the marketing. Uh, it doesn't matter how good your product is. If you cannot say, tell your customer why it's good, forget it. They will not buy it. It is all about marketing. We could have the greatest product in the world, and if we couldn't tell people why it's good, it wouldn't matter. And, uh, and it's not as easy to tell people why something is good as you would think. It's, it's really, because your tendency is you want to tell them everything. It's so good, you've got to just tell them every possible thing. And you have to really reduce it to a simple idea that when you walk away from them, if somebody says, what did they just say to you, they can parrot it back and repeat it back. Plus they have 10 companies coming to them at the same time. Exactly. I mean, that's a different right. Thing. I already talked about the ongoing research. Ongoing technology investment, this is a big deal. Uh, we, you know, uh, Vista comes out, we have to update for Vista. Uh, OS 10 comes out, we have to update for OS 10. 
Um, we want to, uh, so we have constantly to be spending money to keep it up to date with uh, the hardware. There's also investment in, uh, in the web and delivery systems in uh, having a operating system that can deliver uh, great concurrency. So the ongoing technology investment is huge. And of course, capital. Um, and we have a slide later on about how much we've invested in the program. We've invested tens of millions of dollars in this just in making it, and that doesn't include selling it. So, um, you know, if you have a great idea and it's capital intensive, you're almost definitely going to need a partner to help you pull this thing together. Uh, okay, well, you know, Ted and I, I think part of why this whole thing worked is we actually had a lot of common beliefs, and um, uh, one of them was that adolescents are underserved by school and are at high risk, and we've already talked about that. Not many people were thinking about that. If you, if you sort of rewind back to 2000, 2001, and a little before that, everybody was talking about reading by end of grade three. I mean, that was the mantra. You guys are too young to know this, but uh, that was the mantra. That's all anybody talked about, reading by end of grade three. And we were over there talking about middle school, and, uh, and uh, that was, that's been good for us. We also really believe that adolescents want to learn and can be taught. Um, they act resistant, they act angry, they, they are difficult to deal with, but we think that's because they're failing, and if they are given the opportunity to succeed, that they will, they will be happy and, and enjoy school. Um, we believe technology can play a really critical role. One of the really challenging parts about middle school is that obviously is the workload of a teacher. A teacher at middle school might have 150 kids because she's teaching five sections or, or 125 kids. You cannot individualize your teaching for that many kids. So part of the role of technology is to make sure that kids get that individual, at least part of their instruction is individualized. And uh, the other, and this is a very big point, we believe that schools will pay for solutions that work. You know, if you talk to teachers and you tell them what things cost, they say, oh, we can't afford that. Or the first time you talk to anybody in a school and you tell them that this is going to cost X, they always say, well, we don't have enough money for that. But especially since No Child Left Behind, schools do have funding for things that work. They will find it. Um, and, um, and, you know, some people th say, oh, sc the school market, it's such a crummy market. But you know what? There are 55 million kids going to school every day, and those schools are spending billions of dollars on delivering services. You just have to find the right thing that can get them to think about, what can I move from over here that's not working to over here that is working? You talk about that. Uh, yeah, we only have 20 minutes, so yeah. we should, yeah, maybe we don't do the demo. Uh, this is just one of our Read 180 kids. Uh, she's from uh, uh, Texas. Her brother's in prison. Uh, none of her sisters had graduated from high school. She was a very ambitious kid, did not want to go into Read 180, thought she was doing well, went into Read 180, figured out she couldn't read well, told her teacher she wanted to go to college in New York when she was in Read 180. Her teacher's teacher tells a story. The teacher said, well, I didn't tell her. That's impossible. And, and sure enough, Tabitha is in college in New York City. She's going to Hunter, and she works at our offices. And we just, and she's just such a great girl, but she's, rep we have about half a million kids in Read 180, and we feel like there's, you know, the potential for half a million young people like that out there. Yeah. Uh, we'll go quickly. Um, the one thing I love about Scholastic, and, and if you're looking for a publisher, this is something you want to uh, pay attention to, uh, and that is, will they be true to your research? And you know, as academics, that's important to us. And uh, not every publisher will do this. So that's one thing you want to try to figure out on the front end. Uh, same thing is true with the implementation model. As it turns out, I'm convinced that, that fidelity of implementation may be the most important thing for any product. And you've got to make sure that they're willing to use that implementation model in their marketing and certainly in their professional development uh, if you want to see a difference. Uh, make it engaging. Uh, you know, we'll go through this quickly, but they took, as you can see, a stick figure uh, and turned that into a very, very engaging tutor. And that was Scholastic that did that. They, they brought that to the, to the thing. Uh, and, and tell the truth, the, the one thing I like about Scholastic is they don't go out and oversell the product. They will only say what, in fact, I think is true. Uh, and part of that is uh, if you use this product three days a week instead of five days a week, your results aren't going to be as good. And they tell customers that. And I know this for a fact. I know this for a fact that there was uh, one salesperson 
that would not sell to a school because she was sure they were not going to implement this as it was designed. She did not sell the product. Now, I, I thought that was you know, really amazing for a, for a, a publisher to do that. Um, let me just tell you real quickly about Jaworski. I don't know how many of you are football fans, okay? This is bad. Okay, you know who Jaworski Lane is. He's a running back from Texas a and He's about 300 pounds. This guy will be All-American and probably pro. His history is, in Texas, you can't play football unless you pass your courses. He couldn't pass any courses because he could not read, okay? He got into a Read 180 classroom, learned to read well enough that he could then start passing his courses, got a scholarship to A&M. He'll be a junior this next year. And I think at A&M, his, his GPA is now is over three point. And this guy's amazing. And But there was a... The reason I say this is this last fall, he sent me a program from one of the A&M games. And it was a story about Jaworski. They call him the J-Train because he's so big and so fast. And in the story about Jaworski, there was a sidebar. It said, J-Train and the Read 180. And it talk, he talked about Read 180 and how it changed his life and allowed him to come to A&M and play football. So there are, as Margaret said, there are half a million people out there. But these are the stories we know about. There are a lot more that we don't know about. And, and that's the best part of getting your work into the public, you know, into the public domain because you're making a difference with kids. And, and that's what we're all about, I think. You know, that's what I think we're all about. So maybe we should not show sure. the model yeah. and just go and then... Anyway, we, we brought a demo with us, and you know, if anybody wants to see it, we're happy to yeah. show it. Um, I should show you the prototype because it, it, this is such, you know, order the magnitude better than what we did. Uh, but that was but that was scholastic. That's what they brought. Um, there are several zones, and the one thing I will say. Is Snakes. Uh, Anaconda, one of the world. I'm gonna stop that. But every day, the kids start out with a video, okay? And there's a reason for that. There's a theoretical reason for that, because we never want to put a kid in a piece of text that they don't know something about. I mean, you've all experienced, you pick up text, and you read it, it doesn't make a bit of sense to you, because you don't have any knowledge about that. But if we can give the kids the background knowledge first, what we found is it goes a long way toward helping them be successful. And that's the, the anchor and instruction part of this. It really is the underlying core of this thing. Uh, if we had more time, we'd go in and show you a lot more of this. But, uh, the other thing, well, that we did I got the high uh, power. is around technology. Early on, we knew the technology could support struggling readers in ways that text that that uh, a textbook couldn't. So the things that we do uh, that I think make a difference is, you know, they can have that read to them if they can't read it, or if they want to try to read it and they don't know a word, they can click on it. They can get a definition. They can get decoding tips on that word. There's a whole bunch of support built in to make these kids successful. And that's what we try to do, is make these kids successful. Because the moment they start feeling successful, it changes their lives. I mean, for most of these kids, they haven't been successful day in their life. They've struggled and struggled and struggled. And, and success is the most powerful thing that they can do. Um, this is the word zone. I won't go into all. I'm just going to skip through this. This just builds fluency in, in terms of individual words. Uh, spelling, we work on. Uh, you know, kids learning how to spell. Keep on your study words. Yeah. Listen to each word. And uh, this actually, um, I started working on this part of the program when I was at North Carolina State back in 1978 with a Radio Shack model. Uh, what was it, Bill? The, Radio Shack, TRS-80, model, model, three, model three. before that was the first one, anyway. I mean, this thing was so, yeah, it was a model one, I think. Actually. Your geekiness is showing. Yeah, but anyway, so, I mean, so a lot of what you see here goes back, I mean, even before I got to Vanderbilt. But it's really, all that research has gone into this, and, uh, and I think that, to me, that's important. You want to talk a little bit about David? Yeah, um, I... Really, Read 180, if you think of the technology in Read 180, it's really got two pieces to it. One piece is what we call the student application, which is what you saw with the snake stalker and the word zone and the reading zone. And then the other piece is the management system, which is where teachers interact with the data, where educators can go in and see how schools are doing or teachers are doing. Um, this is something that we just brought out in 05 with our Enterprise Edition. And you can't see these things, but these are diagnostic reports that come out on by student, by class, uh, by school. And, uh, and what, what Read 180 does is it's every time a student um, hits a key, every keystroke is captured by the management system. And teachers can open up the management system and in real time see how any student's doing in the program. And, and we measure students against a lot of standardized test type 
uh, skills like making inferences, things like that. But it allows for, a re you know, truly allows for individualized instruction. If a student's having difficulty with a skill, um, the management system has a, 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 an R comes up for resources. Teacher clicks on the resources, takes her to the web, and right there on the web, she'll find a bunch of resources that she can use for that kid with that uh, particular issue. So, what it takes to make it work. All right, I think this is me. Yeah, so um, after we uh, licensed uh, uh, Peabody from um, Vanderbilt, we spent close to $10 million on building the original uh, program. And, and, and for $10 million, we were able to build the, L, the uh, four to six piece and the middle school piece and an, and an early management system, which we've since replaced. Um, we all, but since then, we've spent another $40 million on extending it into high school, uh, upgrading the technology, adding more content. Um, and w so we have at least $50 million invested in the program um, since we first um, licensed it. We also spend, and I lowballed this because in case anybody saw it, I didn't want to put the real number in. Uh, we spend over $3 million a year on technology maintenance. We have to, uh, we do two releases a year with Pat, and we also do periodic patches. You know, I mentioned, you know, Vista comes out, things like that come out. We have to do all kinds of updating. We, and we keep a big team of people that are constantly doing quality testing, um, and that's very expensive. Uh, we also do ongoing efficacy research. And um, we have a standing team of people that work on Read 180 all the time. We have editors, we have instructional designers, we have producers, we have graphic artists, um, and um, and it's it's really a whole business within a business for Scholastic. But it's not just the product investment. Um, there's also the sales and marketing investment, and it's at least as important as the product. We have a sales force that knows how to sell technology. I think sometimes people uh, think that um, you can't sell technology to schools, and sometimes those people are people that are textbook companies that are don't have people who know how to sell technology, or people that uh, are so small that they don't. The decision making cycle in selling to schools is long, so you have to have enough. You have to have good people. You have to have capital, and it takes time. And it's good to have people who know what they're doing. We also have a full team of people across the country work on implementation and do professional development. We have a tech support team, which I mentioned. People go into schools, make sure the stuff's working. Um, we do high-level sales events. Ted mentioned four times a year we do these national events when we bring high-level people in and we introduce them to Read 180. We also do a lot of state events, local events, but there's a lot of, uh, you have to get in front of people, you have to have face time with people, you can't do, you cannot get them to do something like Read 180 without being in front of them because Read 180 means changing what you're doing. Read 180 means you're not going to just have a teacher with a textbook. Now you're going to change what you're doing. Your classroom's going to look like a Starbucks. You're going to do it for 90 minutes. You're going to have computers, and we need the face time. We also have to do a certain amount of lobbying and high-level selling. Uh, Education is political, and uh, you have to be willing to, to do some of that. We don't do as much as some people, but we do do it. We also, of course, have a lot of marketing collateral and advertising. We have over 100 selling pieces, pieces of collateral that go with Read 180. We have to maintain a website, um, and we have to do a whole lot more. That's just a partial list. So if you do have something that you're thinking could be brought to schools, I'm not saying that you have to have everything on that both lists, but um, it's a bit of a checklist for the kinds of things you might want to think about when you're talking to, uh, uh, or if you're starting your own business, or if you're talking to somebody about partnering with them to bring something you've done to the market. I think that's the important thing, is that, you know, make sure when you're talking to a publisher, can they answer those questions for you? Do they, you know, do they have a, a sales team? Do they have, you know, support teams for the technology, which is a huge issue around the technology product. There are just a lot, you know, as Marjorie said, that could almost be a checklist for what you need to be successful. Um, lessons learned, let me, let me start. Um, you know, as I said, when we started, we didn't, we didn't dream that we would ever do a product. That wasn't what we were about. But once we got to that, we started talking to other publishers. As a matter of fact, and Marjorie will probably remember this, when she came and talked to us the first time, we'd already talked to another publisher, and I said, you know, we've got to let, you know, we've got to make a decision 
Uh, I remember and, that. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, luckily we made the right decision because that other company is now out of business. But um, they're not all equal. Uh, and I've learned that. I've worked with a lot of publishers uh, over the years. And let me tell you, they're not all equal. So you've really got to do your due diligence when you're in there talking to these people and understand what they do. I mean, it really is incumbent upon you to figure out, are they the right match for us? And they're not all going to be a good match. And that's really important to understand. Yeah, what do you look for above and beyond the list? That you have? Well, one, I mean, um, that's one thing. But I think, you know, you've got to understand, you know, how is that, that publisher uh, viewed by, by their customers? Uh, I mean, uh, th there were other companies out there that probably could have taken um, a Reap 180 but I'm convinced they wouldn't have done the job that Scholastic did. Uh, in retrospect, in learning more about those companies, they just weren't as respected. I mean, Scholastic is a highly respected company, and, and that's worth a lot. Uh, and not all publishers are highly respected by, uh, by, the, by the public or by their customers. So I think that's something you've got to do, is that due diligence and going out and talking and finding out what do people think about this company, uh, in addition to all those other things that they do. But, um, you know, it's... It's a tricky thing to find out, it really is. Um, I mean, we can talk more about that, but uh, I think that, that is a key. Uh, here's the thing that I think academics have the hardest thing to understand, okay? And that is once they, once they license that from you, it's not your product anymore, okay? You've got to let it go. And that is a hard thing to do. I mean, you put 10 years or more into a piece of work, and you've got to say, okay, you know, and walk away. That's hard. And I think a lot, and, and you can talk more about this, but I think a lot of relationships between academics and publishers have failed because of that. They are not willing to walk away, and they continue to muck around. The academics continue to try to, to make decisions. It doesn't work very well. And uh, so luckily I was able to walk away. But uh, in doing that, you know, Scholastic kept coming back, and that was a good thing. You know, they kept asking us uh, our opinion about things. This is really important. And it, again, it's more about academics, and that is you've got to respect what they know about the marketplace. Uh, and I don't think I did. I mean, I've learned so much about marketing and, and, the, and the field through working with Marjorie and, and her team, and that you know, a lot of times they'll want to do something to your product for market reasons, okay? And you'll go, no, you can't do that, when in fact it's the right decision. They know their market. They've done this for 80 years, and they understand the market. And they may want to do something to your product that you're not crazy about, but usually it's for a good reason. I've learned that over the years, and, and they have made good decisions, obviously. Uh, and so you do need to respect what they know. Uh, and then lastly, and this, this is <laughs> really important, you've got to like the people, okay? And, and that's kind of a gut-level thing. If you don't like them, for God's sake, don't do a deal with them, uh, because you are going to work with them. And it's, it's hard. I, I won't tell you it's all you know, fun and games. It's hard. It's really hard work. And you better like those people because you, know, you have to deal with them for a long time. So that's something that, that you really got to understand. Um, and you have some things. Right? Yeah, well, if it's not going to be effective in schools, don't do it. So we're, we're, you know, what we are looking for when we do, when we're trying, when we want to publish things is we want to publish things that work. We're just have zero interest in going in front of a, a group of educators who are struggling to educate their kids and try to sell them something that's not going to make a difference in their kids' lives. So that's that's like numero uno for me. Will it work? Um, this this was this is you know this is what makes Scholastic a little bit different than other people. We aren't interested in doing what everything everybody else is doing. If everybody else is doing that over there, then we want to go over here. Because you can't really break out if you don't break, if you can't really break through if you don't break out. If you just go, if you just try to do what everybody else is doing, you're going to be one of five, one of seven, one of eight. We want to be one of one. And uh, that's, that's been really good for us. And Read 180 has fulfilled that better than anything. And, you know, someday I'll tell you, Harry Potter sort of did that too. When we signed Harry Potter, it was one of one. Um, what, this is, this is uh, I think this is really important because I, I do meet sometimes with people, researchers who have these really, oh God, they've been working on something for so long and they can tell you all the reasons why it really works great with their kids and how much ch change it's made in kids' lives. And then when they tell you what they're doing, it's so complicated and so human labor intensive 
that we can't possibly publish it. And there have been things that I've been really interested in that we could not figure out how we could actually take that to market because it has to be simple. That's, it has to be simple. It can be complex underneath the hood. Like underneath the hood, Read 180 is extremely complex. You know, we're, we're working with expanded recall and moving things from working memory into stored memory, and it's got all these elegant things underneath the hood. But if you look at it, it looks incredibly simple. It goes, oh, I, that looks simple. I could make that. And that is like when it's successful. Um, the other thing about this is, you know, it's not just about the product. It, it, it can't, you can't be successful if it doesn't start with a good product. It has to start with a good product, but it has to have all those other pieces that I mentioned. It has to have marketing. It has to be able to be supported in schools. You have to have people that can help teachers understand how to use it. It has to have all those pieces because it just cannot be product only. Um, and then, you know, if you're really lucky, you get to find someone like Ted, who's been an incredible partner to us. Uh, we don't do anything to Read 180 that Ted doesn't genuflect over. Um, he's, we have the deepest respect for him. Um, we think he has the best mind. He's the best person. Um, he's a great communicator. Um, he, um, when he talks to educators about his, his research, he, he intrigues them, he entertains them, he educates them. Um, I give Ted enormous credit for Read 180. Uh, you know, it, when I look back on Read 180, it's just one of those things that all the pieces came together. We had the right sensibility. We were already interested in that space in the classroom. Uh, Ted is just such an incredible person. The prototype came with all this great uh, stuff. It was for the right market. You know, and maybe once in your life, all that stuff comes together in such a good way. And uh, we're enormously grateful to Vanderbilt and Ted for the product. Do we have one second? You want to see the original <laughs> prototype? I got a little, a minute, a real tiny little clip of Billy probably this thing. Oops, all the way to the Please click on your name. That's Melvin. Is this your name? Just a second, thanks. So there are the, now we have zones. Those are our original. Click on the Bye. video button and watch the video. There's something else to celebrate today. If you're a hamburger, today is your 100th birthday. That's reason to dress up with relish, catch up with the band, and join the celebration. Jennifer Big Mac Logan has a report. The United States, it seems, is forever in a state of celebration. Birthdays of bridges, anniversaries of fantasies. When you are ready, click on the text button and read about what you just watched. Read this passage several times. If you need help with a word, click on that word. Click on the read button, and I'll read it to you. Well, I'll stop it. There's a lot underlying that, too. I mean, for example, we would know what level that student was reading. The text passage they got was geared for their reading level. We knew which of those words they could read and which words they couldn't read. And then we'd take them into the word lab and work on building fluency on those. So as Marty said, a lot under the hood of this, but that's... 1985 technology. So it brings back numbers. Anyway, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, so we're questions. done. Yeah. yeah, any questions? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when you're in a position like you were when you entered into this agreement, and so now it's a scholastic spot, you've had some money involved. Mm -hmm. What kind of time commitment is involved in that? How variable is it? Uh, I mean, there may be other scenarios that would work other than the one that you've experienced. Yeah, I think it's highly variable. I think depending upon the publisher and the product and things like that. Um, like I said, you know, <clears throat> four times a year I do their intervention convention. So you know, I'll go down and do that. You know, if they're making changes, I'll go up to New York and we'll sit for a day and, and talk about what those are going to be. Um, but you know, it's not a huge time commitment because they. They own it. I mean, they have a huge time commitment, but I don't. I mean, it's it's so yeah, 15 percent, 20 percent of my time. Yeah. It's not that much. Not that much. No, we'll that much. No. I, so, I don't think so. I don't think it'll be 10 percent. Uh, probably less than that. But um, you know, I I think with other products it might even be less. With some it could be more. I'm sure. But 
Yeah, I mean, you know, when you talked about how to choose a publisher, one of the things that I, I think is you have to have trust. I mean, yes, you have to give up your product, but you have to have trust. So uh, I think that that, you know, I, I, we, we trust each other. I trust that if I go and ask Ted a question about something that we might think Read 180 should do or something we should, you know, change, I trust that he'll have great judgment and he'll, and, and we would never do anything that you thought was really a mistake. Um, and he trusts us the other way. So uh, he knows that uh, we'll come to him, we'll ask him questions. We, you don't get many surprises about Read 180. Oh, no. He no, knows everything yeah. we do to it. Yeah. We communicate every change. He signs off on everything. And, uh, and he knows that if something is, is, if he's unhappy about something, we won't do it. And I think that's rare. I think that's really rare. I think that that is unusual. Um, I think it's been good that, that we've both been on it as long as we have. There's a lot of management change in a, all organizations like this one. And uh, uh, I think that's been good for the product because we, 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 we're somewhat protective about it. We're not, we, we, we don't want someone to come in and all of a sudden, you know, redo the whole thing. I think that's really important. I mean, you and I have been involved in this since 95. And you know, one fear I have is that Marge is going to get another job somewhere and leave and someone comes in and doesn't have that history because they could really screw this up. Uh, not having that history, but she has the history, she understands it, uh, and I think someone else may not do the same. I mean, that is a fear of mine. I mean, that, that, well, I mean, somebody wouldn't want to come in and screw it up in terms of sales. Certainly not. Yeah, but certainly certainly not on purpose. But you know what happens? You, we get all kinds of criticisms, you know? Like, we get things like, oh, um, you know, the, the design needs to be updated so it looks more like the web. Or, you know, people just say all kinds of things. We hear stuff all the time. And you have to be, you know, or you get one comment from one person, like uh, the this book is too hard, you know, it needs to be easier. And your sales reps will call you up, and you know, they maybe they didn't get a big sale because somebody made one comment about something. And you have to really protect yourself from, from you know, like okay, we're going to go change everything. And that's one of the things publishers do. They hear one comment and they go and they change it all, and then they're, they look up and they have this thing that's you know lost its center. And um, I think that it's a, it's a, you know, it's a balancing act. Like you have to change because you, we know things now that we didn't know 10 years ago. But you also have to protect yourself against, you know, random acts of changeness. That's uh, so. It's, uh, but it's it's been it's been the greatest thing for us and for Scholastic. And uh, thank you so much for inviting us down. I have one. Of course. Well, uh, so you mentioned professional development. And, uh, so you make a sale and you support that sale. You mentioned quality of innovations and what sort of support is designed in that way. Uh, what's the nature of this professional development uh, resource? Uh, how much of it do you have? How do you, how do you distribute it to your customers? Uh, this is this is, is it person based or electronic? This is this is really hard because we when you buy the program it comes with two days of professional development. We come in at the very beginning to get teachers started, and then we come back about five or six weeks later after they've been using it for a month to come in and you know do a deeper day of professional development. We also provide every new teacher in Read 180 with an online course on Read 180. And we have additional online courses around adolescent literacy that are available for schools that are interested in it. Um, we also have um, uh, seminars that schools can buy from us where, you know, they're, they're, where we'll come in and we'll go deeper on reading data or, um, you know, whatever. We have 10 topics, I think. But what's really hard about this, Andy, is there's so much teacher turnover in inner city schools that we end up, and we end up with uh, maybe, you know, we, we showed that teacher retention slide because that was such a good news story for us. The best thing in the world for us is teacher retention because then we have a teacher who's getting an expert at Read 180. But there's probably 25 to 30 percent turnover of teachers in, in urban schools, you know, maybe worse. And we and, and, and trying to keep all those teachers trained 
And we need the school districts to pay for some of this because we can't go back into every school district where we have Read 180 and train for free over and over again. So, um, you know, one of the big risks in Read 180 is that we become a victim of our own success. Because the more Read 180 that's out there and the more we have to support, the more expensive it is. And, um, and trying to make sure that Read 180 is used well because the way we sell more is for it to be successful and for you know, schools to believe in it. So we need to have trained teachers, but we also need to make sure that, um, that we're not going bankrupt going into every district where, where Read 180 resides and trying, having to retrain teachers every year. It's tricky. It's extremely tricky. Um, I, you know, we, we use what we call a hybrid uh, approach to online where uh, we, and we, ha we have a strand for the language arts coordinator or, the, or your favorite, the coach, and um, they're supposed to bring teachers together and talk about stuff. So um, I just don't think online's a substitute for in person, but I think it's a great supplement to in person because we can dig deeper and deeper. And, uh, and the online course has a ton of resources. So we have all kinds of downloadable articles and professional papers. Ted's in the course, so uh, if they, if they want to hear Ted talk about things, we, we repeat things in the course that they would have heard. So we talk about uh, the failure cycle and other things. So I think we have about Um, probably about a 50% completion rate on the online course, and it really varies from 100%. The Department of Defense uses Read 180. They have a 100% completion rate. Um, yeah. Uh, and other places probably have a 10% completion rate. So, um, you know those DOD schools uh, play out as effective in terms of value education? They're outstanding. I, they, you know, I, I guess if you look at their numbers and you and you look at their population of students, they, you know, they have a lot of kids that are their families on food stamps because they have a lot of high, high, you know, a lot of families with a lot of children without a lot of income, and they're doing a great job in those schools. They, they all 100% completion. So. Uh, We have we have both. We have probably about I would say about 40 full-time people doing uh, PD, and I would I would call them PD and implementation. Um, and then we have uh, probably another hundred people that we use as per diems. Um, we have almost one person per state on average. Sorry about breakout uh, products. Uh, what are the breakout products and markets? In <laughs> Whoa. Uh, well, we would really, really, when we just were talking to um, your dean about this, we would love to have a math 180. Uh, that would be fantastic. And, you know, if we could do it with Peabody, we would love to do it with Peabody. I mean, uh, that would be terrific. We, we've spent some time researching math, and, and we were just talking about it with Camilla, that uh, it's hard to find the kind of direction in math that there is in reading. Um, I think that's I think that's a huge one. Um, I, I think that you know people talk about science and social studies. I think that's going to be hard to make that a big breakout because I just I just think there's so much there's so many differences by state and uh, there's not as much money put into it. One of the things that uh, we're interested in, but we don't know how to how to do this, is sort of helping kids understand more about careers and the world of work and what their choices are. So that could be, that's sort of an interesting area. But probably the biggest kahuna of interesting area is if you believe that every student is going to have some kind of computer, then what happens to curriculum when every kid has a computer? I mean, I know in colleges every kid has a computer and you still have textbooks, but at some point there's going to be some kind of tipping between digital uh, curriculum and textbook book-based curriculum. And will the companies that have the textbooks, will they make that transition to being the leaders in digital curriculum? Or will a switch to digital curriculum, um, will, that, will that 
create opportunities for new players, new companies? You know, will, could somebody dislocate the, the educational um, environment like Google's dislocated on search? Could something like that happen? And I think that's a really intriguing question, and I have no idea what the answer is. Alternative technologies. Yeah. Um, you know, because I sit here and watch our kids text everything all day. I wonder how can we integrate this stuff into the classroom? No, totally. We, you know, so, absolutely. We're very interested in alternative technologies and. Uh, no, I mean, we, you know, we've met with Apple and talked to them about iPods. And there, there's issues about, you know, when, there's issues about hardware and who owns the hardware and what can your hardware assumptions be and you know it's schools are already putting computers into schools and kids are sharing computers and they're on carts and they're moving all around and you know all this once you start talking about technology like cell phones and iPods and then then you start to think about well who owns the iPod who owns a cell phone how does that get how does that get distributed and it's you know, but we're we're totally totally interested in it. We you know if if it can deliver achievement, we're interested. Thank you so much. Thank you.